Hello and welcome back to my channel, hope you're well. If you're new here, my name is Emily Rao and on my channel we talk about all things yoga related. This week we're looking at the sun salutations, Surya Namaskar. Now this is a sequence that you have probably practiced many, many times, whatever style of yoga you do, bar maybe yin yoga and restorative, pretty much any other style of yoga, you're going to practice the sun salutations wherever you are in the world. Now over the years, I have seen hundreds of people practicing this sequence and there are five things that I want to point out that are not really mistakes, I've called it mistakes for the purpose of the uh, title of this video, but there are five points that I'm gonna point out to you in a second. That was my dog sneezing. <laughs> five things that tend to show up in different people quite commonly as areas where you could make an improvement. Just a small change will be enough to engage your muscles more efficiently and reduce your chance of getting injured. So I'm gonna show you myself doing these five things up here and see if you can spot what I'm gonna say before I say it. I've got a little helper now, she just wanted to hop up on my lap. So um, introductions, this is Penny Rao, for those of you who don't know her. She is due a beard trim and a haircut in a couple of days, so please don't judge her on her scruffy appearance at the moment. Okay. Let's give it a watch. See if you can spot the first thing before I mention it. <laughs> That's the first one, that rounding of the back in a forward fold or Uttanasana. So I see this really often and the best way to prevent this or the best way to work around it is actually to focus on keeping the spine nice and long. Don't worry about the trying to touch the ground. What we want to do is take a little bend in the knees and take that tilting forwards action from the pelvis. So we want to think about bringing the belly towards the thighs and that's going to lengthen along the backs of the legs. Doesn't matter if the legs are straight or not. And you can then either have your arms reaching down or you can just rest your hands on your legs or maybe even have hands on your hips. But the focus here wants to be on lengthening the back and not worrying too much about touching the toes. And with time then it might get easier to get the hands down towards the ground and then with a little bit more time and flexibility the legs might straighten out a bit more. So that was number one. Let's see what the second thing is. Did you see that? <laughs> so this might look really obvious but this is I would say one of the most common things that I don't think people realize they're doing. So this is coming into either plank pose or even in half plank with the knees down, you can see that my back is really dropping and drooping. Okay, and he's gone. Um, so here you can see my chest and my hips and my belly are dropping towards the ground. Now this means that my core isn't really switched on, I'm not using much strength in the body, just dropping into the shoulders and the arms. Here's how we can self-correct it. So first of all, we wanna think about pulling the belly button in and lifting into the lower back. Pre-COVID times, I would often come around in class when we were allowed to touch people in classes um, and just place my hand on their back, just the middle section of the back and ask them to lift into my hand, to press their back into my hand. So that's the first thing you can think about in this plank position. Imagine someone's hand is just on your sort of mid back and think about lifting, pushing your back into it. And then the second thing you can do, which you'll see here, did you see that? That subtle movement, I'll show you again, is actually lifting up into the upper back as well, engaging the shoulders. So there I would place a hand just between the shoulder blades and the same action of resisting against the hand pushing up into it. So each time you come into plank, this is a way you can check with yourself. See if you can lift your midsection of your back into an imaginary hand that's placed just there. And then the same thing, lifting into the space between your shoulder blades. Let's see what's next. There we go, can you see it? So this is when we come up into cobra or maybe upward facing dog, this action, crunching the shoulders up to the ears, really tensing in the upper back and the shoulders and in the neck. In fact, I'll show you the first time I tried to replicate this, this is what happened and you can hear how uncomfortable and painful it was for me. <laughs> Ow. Ow, that really hurt. Ah. 
Jesus. Oh. So what's happening when we're arriving in this position is we're pushing really hard with the hands to try and lift up into that back bend position. Whereas what we actually want to do is learn to engage the muscles in the back of the body, in the back and in the glutes to help us lift into that back bend with less effort in the shoulders so that we can keep the shoulders drawing down, keep the neck nice and long and protected and find that just gentle lift with less strain and less pain really around the neck. So here's what it could look like. So can you see there that my neck looks so much longer, my shoulders are all the way down, far, far away from my ears. And actually there, if I wanted to, I could almost float the hands off the ground so that my back muscles were doing all the work. So that's something that I would recommend to try out here is next time you're practicing this and coming up into that shape, try and float your hands away from the ground, keep your shoulders drawing down your back and then see if you can just gently lift and feel the muscles in your back switching on. And actually one more thing on that, when you come up into that shape, you don't have to look all the way up towards the ceiling. That can often bring a bit more um, crunching into the back of the neck. So I always advise just keeping the head fairly neutral, either looking to the ground or just very slightly looking forwards. There we go, so this is number four. Downward facing dog, not always an easy pose to come into. It's one that we practice quite regularly, but it can take a long time to figure it out in your own body. So what's happening here is I'm trying to keep my legs straight and I'm trying to get my heels down to the ground. But what's happening as a result of that is my back is rounding and there's a lot of weight going into my hands. My arms are having to take most of the weight here. So as you can see, it doesn't look like it feels very nice in the back and I'm not really getting much out of this posture other than putting a lot of strain through the shoulders and through the arms and struggling probably to hold it for very long. <laughs> so here's what we can do instead. Similarly to in forward fold, Uttanasana, the key here is thinking about lengthening out the spine. So you can see I've put a little bend into my knees and then I'm pushing with my hands and lifting the hips up and towards the back of the mat. So by doing that, I'm lengthening out the spine and I'm evening out the weight between my hands and my feet. So my arms and legs are doing a similar amount of work to hold me in that position, rather than all of the weight being forwards in the hands. You can also see here that my heels are off the ground a little bit, that's fine. Doesn't matter if your heels ever touch the ground in downward facing dog, that's not a measure of how good you are at yoga. In fact, a lot of people genetically will never get the heels to the ground because that, that joint is just not designed to, to go that far. So let go of that if that's a goal that you have in mind and focus instead on trying to find as much length through the spine as you can in downward facing dog. And then with time and practice, you might find that you're able to start straightening out the legs while also keeping that straight back, but really the straight back is the key here. Okay, so there's one more to look out for. Number five, see if you can spot it. <laughs> okay, that's pretty obvious. So stepping from downward facing dog up to the top of the mat, back to a forward fold. Not an easy transition to take, stepping that foot forwards. So what I often see is the foot will come a little bit like this, and then you get a bit stuck, and so you'll just walk up to the top of the mat. So I'm gonna give you a couple of different alternatives that you can try here instead. So here's the first one. Taking the foot as far as it will go, and then giving it a hand, and bringing it towards the top of the mat, and then stepping the rest of the way. So this is a good practice to get into because you are still taking that step and you'll find that over time and with practice, you'll be able to step a little bit further each time, but you're giving yourself a little hand and encouraging that foot forward. Then another option that is really simple and a really nice way to make this transition work for your body is coming down to the knees and then bringing one foot forward and then stepping the rest of the way. So coming down to the knee and then giving that foot a hand if it needs it, and then you can come up to the top of the mat into a forward fold from there. So there are options with this transition. It doesn't have to look like anybody else's version of it, 
but if you are just sort of giving up and walking to the top of the mat, I'd advise trying one of those two instead. So those are the main five things that I wanted to point out. Now, of course, the difficulty is knowing whether you're doing that in your own practice because it's not always that easy to feel what your body is doing. So I would recommend putting your camera alongside your yoga mat and filming yourself. Do a couple of rounds of sun salutations, watch it back and see if you can spot any of the things that we've just talked about. I know it might sound a little bit scary to film and watch yourself, but seeing yourself doing that sequence can help you to understand it a little bit more and give you a bit more confidence in your abilities. And also something that we develop in our yoga practice is what's called proprioception. Now this is the body's knowledge of what it's doing. <laughs> your body's awareness of what each body part is doing. So for example, a simple example of proprioception is being able to walk without having to look down at our feet. We just walk, our bodies know what they're doing. And with yoga poses, when you first start out, if you think about the first time you tried to do a warrior two, for example, you probably had no idea what your back arm was doing because you're looking over here. You don't know whether your legs are bent or straight. It takes a while to feel what your body is doing without looking at each individual body part. But that is something that we develop really quickly with yoga, proprioception. So the more you practice the sun salutations, the more you will be able to recognize these things in yourself without having to look at it. You'll be able to feel, ah, my shoulders are tensing up in this pose, so I'm gonna do this instead. Or my back is kind of dropping down in plank, so I'm gonna lift up into it instead. It does get easier with time and practice, but first of all, it takes an awareness of how to self-correct. I hope you found that helpful. If you did, remember to subscribe to this channel. I put out new videos every week. Give me a little thumbs up as well. That's always really appreciated. If you have any questions or anything else you'd like to know, leave me a comment below and I will definitely get back to you. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.